Welcome to Profiles in Eccentricity, a show about weirdos, with your hosts, John Fahey and Darren Peter. Welcome to Profiles in Eccentricity. My name is John Fahey. We are a show about weirdos. I am joined by my very, very pretty co-host, Mr. Mr.? Mr.? Mr. 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 Aaron Pita. Oh, hello, Aaron. Hi, John. It's great to see you again. It's good to see you. I'm very excited to tell you about these couple of weirdos. We're going to sandwich two. Ooh, a weirdo sandwich? Yes. I want to tell you about two exploitation horror directors from the late 70s, early 80s Mm. that created two just disgusting movies. You know me and how much I love disgusting. Yes. I'm going to start by telling you about a phenomenon that started in the early 60s, uh, the Mondo films. Uh The Mondo films were... Basically, like, the first one came out in 1962, Mondo Carne, which translates to Dog's World. And it was a collection of clips from all over the world that were supposed to show... It's the first shockumentary. Uh So it's, like, it's supposed to show, like, backhand it with showing American or European civility with showing the savagery and craziness of the rest of the world. Right. These are Italian movies, These are Italian. And uh, it was started by a guy named uh, Giacopetti and Prosperi. And... They were basically showing things that were of kind of a barbaric nature. But at first they would show you a clip, say, of boys lining up to be the test subjects on the beach in California for lifeguard girls in training. So it's like, ooh, you know, yeah. like these boys. And then it immediately cuts to a woman like in the jungle breastfeeding a pig to keep it alive. (laughs) So it's like, it's just like, you know, like totally showing you like, hey, this is how you're used to living, but this is how other people live Mm -hmm. and it's a nightmare. Mm -hmm. Like, it's very unflattering. Mm -hmm. Um, So they show tribal rituals, animal slaughter, and a lot of this stuff, if you remember like cable... When we were growing up, yeah. there was a lot of modern documentaries, or yeah, even like well, Faces of Death. Right. So eventually, the genre boiled down into either two people want two things from this genre: they either want sex or they want violence. So yeah. there would be Mondo Topless and then Faces of Death. Right. Right. Which a lot of that was faked. Mm-hmm. A lot of it is fake death footage. Mm-hmm. But there would always be this real animal death footage. And I just want to tell listeners at this point that we are going to be talking about a lot of gross stuff. Just heads up. A little bit of a warning. Um, so there, grab your lube. Yeah, there's some, there's some, there's some, uh, there's some hard, hard stuff uh, that we're gonna be talking about in here. It's not for the squeamish, no. No. So Jacopetti and Prosperi, they put these movies out, and they do extremely well, right? Because and they're putting these out like uh, in, theaters, in theaters and uh, like all over the world. Mm-hmm. And it's, you know, they're still riding on kind of that B movie circuit, you know, like that people will still check out trashy stuff and they're definitely appealing to viewers in a trashy way and they do a a third film there's mondo carne mondo carne 2 and then they do one called goodbye africa Uh. and in that they show basically what all of the post-colonial terrible things that are happening Mm -hmm. in africa and that one was panned hardcore by critics as being straight up racist uh huh. And they were defending it like, no, 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 no. We're trying to say that this is the fault of Europeans and right. their colonialism in Africa. But there were some things where a lot of their stuff would be staged too for sensationalist reasons. And there's a rebel that gets captured in the Congo. And these guys supposedly showed up just in time to see his execution. But a lot of people thought that the army in the Congo was really waiting for these guys to show it to them. But they said they never paid anybody off and stuff like that. And then they make another movie called Goodbye, Uncle Tom. Oh, hmm, I wonder what's that about? So that's kind of like depicting like more uh, of like tragedies of American slavery. And it's kind of like a like a retro piece. Like they're they're having people reenact these things. And people again are like, this is astonishingly racist. (laughs) Like this is. So fucked up. Uh, Roger Ebert waited in about Goodbye, 
Uncle Tom, this is what he said about Goodbye Uncle Tom. He said, they have made the most disgusting, contemptuous insult to decency ever to masquerade as a documentary. And this is the guy that wrote <laughs> Return to Valley of the Dolls. Right, right, which yeah. Which is a dog shit motion picture. When, Af- oh, when Goodbye Africa came out, it was the protests against it. It was the first anti-racist protest in Germany post-war. That was like we'll the see res- good things come out of the response art. to this thing. And um, a guy named uh, Riz Ortolani did the, uh, I mean, beautiful orchestral soundtracks to these movies. And he also did the soundtrack to the movie I want to talk about with you, Cannibal Holocaust by Ruggiero Diodato. Mm-hmm. Ruggiero Diodato, basically like an Italian cinema, if there was any big hit, you would kind of follow the trend with a bunch of knockoffs. Right. So when Conan the Barbarian came out, Italian cinema started making shitty sword and sandals epics. Yeah. If like police comedies were hot, there would be a shitload of them. So all these directors were kind of following that. Ruggiero Diodato resurrected a genre that was originally started by a guy called Umberto Lenzi about cannibals in the jungle. Right attacking white people on safari or whatever. Right, which is one of like the pillars of exploitation cinema. It's all it's cults, cannibals, right. uh, zombies. Zombies, Nazis. Yes, exactly. So part of what he was trying to do here was attack this whole Mondo phenomenon, which had really gotten out of hand. The cannibal Holocaust guy. Yeah, but he mm-hmm. also felt like this wasn't even just a problem for the Mondo creators. This had now become a problem for media, period, because blood and gut sells. Yeah. And in the 70s, there was a communist insurrectionist group called the Red Brigades in Italy. And they actually... This could be an episode all on its own, but they successfully kidnapped and assassinated a prime minister of the country. And none of these guys were ever really caught. Like, <laughs> what? Like, and so, but the, 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 the media in Italy is up in arms, and uh, he saw some footage about the Red Brigades that he believed to be staged. And so he thought this thing now with media, fake news. Right, right. Is even. You know, like, it's even coming into the news media now, this staging of, of shit to portray things a certain way. So, like, proto, hey, this is a fake ISIS video. Yes. Break this down. This guy's literally not dead, right? Paid, right. A- paid actors type of stuff. So he's going to, he's he's kind of, he, he sometimes he says, like, no, I'm just trying to make a cannibal horror movie. Sometimes he's saying, no, this has very specific uh, political ambitions. But he goes down to the Amazon in Colombia, and he is with actual tribes that he names but like by their real names in the movie there's the Yamamamo and also the Shamatari uh-huh. and he takes Italian uh, or European actors and also American actors and he makes this movie and it's it's basically this is the this is the premise of the movie spoiler alert if you want to watch this movie which is this is a very famous exploitation movie like it's, even, it's, even I know about Cannibal Holocaust right it's it's come about to be in retrospect people have said this is a just a terrifyingly it's it's dreadful mm. there's just a stench to it it lingers uh-huh. on you after you see it it's one of the closest times I've been to getting sick watching a movie which is how they would promote these movies a lot which right. was like oh, people are running out their pu- they give you a barf bag in the theater yes repeat to yourself it's only a movie right. it's only a movie right. that was the uh and it, it features a lot of genuine animal slaughter alongside scenes of rape and murder that are of course fabricated mm-hmm. but it starts with um a documentary crew is missing in the Amazon, so they have an NYU anthropologist go down, Harold Monroe, who is played by famous porn actor Roger Kerman. Mm, from such hits as... Excuse me, Robert Kerman. Uh, Robert Kerman was in Debbie Does Dallas. Okay. He was in a lot of movies, but he could actually act. Like right. Brian O'Hara, our previous guest yeah. on the program, was saying he would see this guy in clips and be like, right. oh, this guy's like an actual actor. Right. Um, he wasn't Dave Ruby or whatever. <laughs> right. Um, so... I just want to give you a couple of uh, Robert Kerman's aliases. Uh, most famous was R. Bala. Uh-huh. Uh, also known as R. Bolo, Trevor Manmack, Tom Triplett, Bobby Ball, Richard Bala, Richard Lane, Richard Bala, <laughs> Richard Baller, Richard Baca, Robin Hook, Martin Spellman, Neil Rands, Robert Brown, 
Robert Kearns, Sam Speed. <laughs> Those are all of his names <laughs> from the movies he was in in porn. So basically, he goes down and he he discovers these tribes. His character discovers these tribes, and he is um f- discovers the remains of the film crew, and he tr- he trades with the tribes people. Uh, they believe his tape recorder is magic, and he's a- they give him the reels back that the documentary mm-hmm. crew show. So he brings it back to New York, and he's seen the footage. And he brings it back to the television station that wants to show the documentary that these guys were making. And the television station is showing the character Alan Yates, who led the documentary crew down there, his previous movie. And it's called Last Road to Hell. And it's clearly a riff on Goodbye Africa. It's showing like oh. staged executions mm-hmm. and how this guy was basically a piece of shit that was whipping up violence just for the sake of the camera. So... He shows he shows all this all this stuff, and they see all the all the footage edited, where it looks like all these tribe people are just savage, violent murderers and rapists. And then he's like, "No, no, no! I got to show you the rest." So this is now the second half of the film, and it's all found footage. This is where it came Blair from. Witch yeah. came from, and you see that the documentary crew goes down there, and they're just huge pieces of shit. They find these tribes people and they herd them into a shack and then they set it on fire to make it look like an opposing tribe did it. <laughs> oh fuck. Yeah. Yeah. They they rape a girl, you know, right. and they do all this stuff and, and Well, it, this is where you can see the his political kind of messaging here is that It's pretty blatant. Yeah. It's 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 definitely saying he so he brings back the the lost footage, he's showing all this, and like these guys are just the worst pieces of shit, and then you see on camera the Tribes people have their revenge on them, which is equally as murderous and full of rape and horrible, horrible stuff. When the documentary crew is terrorizing these people, one of the things they do is they gang rape this woman and then impale her on a stake, uh huh, which comes out of her mouth, right? So it's and they say it was uh, like tribes people's revenge for uh-huh. finding out she wasn't a virgin or something insane like that. <laughs> Right. And now, meanwhile, the whole time you're watching this movie, there's just tons of animals getting slaughtered. And sometimes. And and that's real. And that is all real. Yeah. There's a muskrat killed. There's a long, lurid scene. A sea, tall, a sea turtle is like decapitated and like dissected. And that's what people are going to get pissed about. Right. Well, right. Well, (laughs) the thing is, is that it's, it's, it's awful. Yeah. I mean, it's unconscionable. Like these animals were definitely killed for the camera. First and foremost, and like what his defense later was like, well, we ate everything that we killed, and it's like, yeah, but only because you wanted to film it first, you know. So, yeah, it, but and then he also defended it, saying like, oh, well, nobody says anything about it when El Topo and the Holy Mountain and Apocalypse Now, Apocalypse Now, that was a that their excuse in Apocalypse Now when they slaughter that wildebeest or water buffalo is that it was ha- it was happening anyways, right? It was a they were watching a real life. Um, sacrifice slash, you know, right. hunt happening, and and yeah, it was going to happen whether they were there or not. Who knows if that's so? True. Part of what he's saying, well, at like, uh, you know, Robert Kerman plays like the the voice of reason to this thing, and in real life, Robert Kerman was also the voice of reason of like he was like, do not kill these animals. Like he walked off set, and in years afterward, he was like, I regret coming back. Like, but uh, what for reshoots? Like for for um. I mean, like, basically continuing the project, finishing the project. Oh, right, 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 okay. But he was livid about this. and uh, So he was livid, and his character was also livid. Yes, and the character shows all this to the television station in the movie, and the television station's like, we'll just burn the footage. Mm. And it ends with the character saying, sometimes I wonder who the real cannibals are. So, of course, the whole thesis of this thing is, what is it to be who's, civilized? Yeah, who's got the bloodlust here? Yeah, like, we're equally, of course, just as savage. Mm-hmm. But in the meantime, he's made this just over the top, like, it's one of the most brutal movies ever made, hands down. Like I said, it was almost making me sick. And some of the people that defend the animal stuff, like Lloyd Kaufman from Troma, mm-hmm. defends it by saying all of this human on human violence seems more real because you see all this real stuff and it just adds up in your mind. But other people like Kerman are like, this is just terrible. Like, this is just awful to do. I was a younger, weaker man when I made this movie and I should not have gone through with it. It was terrible to do. But then the movie is so successful that Umberto Lenzi, who originally started the genre, comes back and makes Cannibal Ferox, 
starring fucking Robert Kerman again. Uh. So, like, I have no, like, which had just as much animal slaughter in it again and was had none of the political overtones. It was just, oh, wow. Yeah, you know, fucking white man versus savages bullshit. Right. So what happened to his morality in there? I do not know. It's porn, porn's tough business, man. To, sometimes right. you got to work on the side. And but Grindhouse stuff. releasing Tarantino's company bought the rights to this, and he made like a deluxe DVD version of, of it. Of Cannibal Holocaust? Of Cannibal Holocaust. And they had a lot of interviews with the cast, and Kerman in that is very animated with his interviewers on camera saying, do not release this movie with those scenes in it. Do not do it. Like, I'm serious. Do not do this. It's wrong. Wow. And because of that like stance, they included an entire cut of the film without the animal scenes. Right. Right. But that's also the best marketing you can have for a movie is don't show it. Right, right. Well, it gets the marketing aspect of this gets way way crazier. In also from that uh that behind the scenes uh, or the interview DVD release footage the guy who plays the shithead leader of this documentary crew that gets his comeuppance, the guy who plays Alan Yates, this guy was a fucking Broadway actor. And he's, he gets a fucking thing saying, hey, sail on down the Amazon. We're shooting. He has no idea what he's getting into. Ugh. And he sees all of these tribes people that, who are real tribes people that are involved in the production. Right. And those, again, like I said, they were the real names, of the, the Shamatari. Yeah. Those were all real tribes. And they weren't enemies. You know what I mean? Right, like, right, right. So it was still like this kind of like racist, savage portrayal of real stuff. Yeah. Even though he's like making fun of that, you know? Right, right. So, so this guy, his interview is hysterical because he's saying, he's like, once I saw these animals getting killed, I figured this fucking Italian madman is going to start killing people next. So he's like, I kept a bag packed next to my bed every night just to be ready to flee down the river again. <laughs> like, you wonder, you wonder if this guy kept a journal. You know, he's a Broadway yeah. actor, probably journals every night. Like, yeah. Dear Lord, what have I gotten myself into for the name of art? So it premieres in Milan, right, in 1980. Diodato is immediately arrested on obscenity. Now the movie is, is playing in France, and all these rumors start that this is a snuff film, right, that these people are actually dead. Diodato has everybody in the film sign a contract to not doing anything public for a year. Genius. So that people actually think that these people are dead. So he knew. Oh, he knew exactly what he was doing, right? Oh, it's brilliant. Yeah, until they amend his obscenity charges to include murder. (laughs) (laughs) So now... So even now, better. So even now better. he's arrested for murder. So he's got to call these actors and he has them all come to Italy and, and be interviewed contract. on fucking Italian television. So then they drop all the murder charges. But now uh, like people are, are are banning the movie all over the fucking place. In the first in the first couple of weeks before it gets banned. Like I I mean maybe not even I think it's 10 days. 2 mil. It made 2 million dollars. 2 million dollars. Per- Right? That's a lot of money. In Japan. Oh. In Japan. They love it. It comes in second ever at the time to E.T. <laughs> My jaw <laughs> But don't gape. Re- but don't forget, I mean, Faces of Death was a number one film in Japan also, it by makes, the way. It all makes sense. Right. International, ultimately, Cannibal Holocaust, 200 mil. Is 200 it, million dollars. Is that the biggest exploitation film I mean, I mean, I don't know because the thing is, is that the that's old money too. The harder it was to get, the more it sold. Like once you can say banned in fifty countries and mean it, yeah. Like and that was always the tag for like Faces of Death and stuff. Right, but they were ones. all ripping off this. Yeah, they were all saying this. You know what I mean? In New Zealand, it's still banned. Mm-hmm. Right? They were they're just like, no thanks, mm-hmm. we don't want it. Britain, it was a big part of starting uh, what was l- called the Video Nasties mm-hmm. in Britain, where they just started a list of movies that were like, you can't do this. And this is also at the dawn of VHS. Yeah. So a lot of movies can now circumvent the they, theater uh-huh. thing, and they had the most shocking artwork of all time. So the Video Nasties mm-hmm. VHS artwork is like an art movement of itself, because mm-hmm. it was just like things screaming from the shelf, rent me, mm-hmm. get me off this shelf. You know what I mean? So there's... <laughs> His, you know, his charges are dropped. He still is embroiled in obscenity stuff for the the longest time, you know. And he's he's uh when when the movie comes out, Sergio Leone okay writes him and he says, "What a movie! The second part is a masterpiece of cinematic realism, 
but everything seems so real that I think you will get in trouble with all of the world. <laughs> if that's not an endorsement. Ten days. It was ten days before seizure. I'm sorry. Ten days before seizure, it was it was two mil. Jeez. Japan, 21 mil. That was it. And then 200 mil worldwide. So this guy, he goes on finally when he when he can make money off this thing, when they start letting it be allowed and he's out of court, then uh, he finally comes back and he starts doing um, movies with uh, David Hess from Last House on the Left. Yeah. And one of those is a uh, Last House on the Left ripoff with a pretty neat twist uh-huh. called House on the Edge of the Park. And it is also just especially brutal. David Hess wields this razor in it, and it's just awful. Was David Hess the dad? David Hess was the main tormentor, uh-huh, uh, played Krug. Right. Who, again, Krug was named after a bully Wes Craven had. Yeah, if, and if that, you don't know what Last House on the Left, it was, it was Wes Craven's first movie. Yeah. And it's it, it's actually a take on old like Norwegian morality tale. Yes. and uh, it, It's a uh, Bergman. Yeah, it's a riff on Bergman. Ingmar, Berg, Ingmar yeah. Berg, Bergman, and you know that that was the the advertising for that movie was keep telling yourself it's only a movie. Yeah, it's only a movie, and I mean you go back and watch these these Grindhouse trailers like that, and it's it's just it it takes you back, and it's it's really really its own style. Of yeah, advertisement of promotion of trailer of not a right. movie, etc. And a big part of this stuff too was I mean this this thing of acting like hey this shit is real. You know, had never really been done before, and, and, and not since until until Blair Witch and the Found Footage stuff came back around in the late '90s. Right, and now it's just a trope that we all recognize. Ah, oh, that's real. Okay, you know what I mean, and you know whatever. But I mean, in 1974, when Texas Chainsaw Massacre came out, and it was like, here's the story of these fucking people. Mm-hmm. You bought it. Yeah. You were like, it's 1974. You're like, what? Well, fucking the narrator's not lying to me. Yeah. Like, there's text on the screen. Yeah. It's obviously fucking- They shot this on film. It must have happened. <laughs> yeah. That was, that was another- That was a big- That was a breakthrough for, for not just exploitation, but horror. That was a big crossover. Yeah. That really changed the game. Yeah. And I mean, like, the, uh, like you got to keep in mind, too, is that, that, like, during all of this, Vietnam is either still going on or fresh. And uh, there is a weird corollary between real-life violence going mm-hmm. on in the world through war- and the appetite for horror cinema mm-hmm. because people w- w- somehow want to glimpse at it. Like even when we had the 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 newest Iraq war, mm-hmm. that's when Saw came out. Mm-hmm. That's when Hostel came out. Like it really reflects mm-hmm. that like there's something about that collective unconsciousness yeah. that um well and, and now also be ever after after Vietnam or during Vietnam they banned you can see footage mm-hmm. anymore and so but everybody kind of knows it's going on and we can we do have this yeah bloodlust yeah of we guys- i mean the most famous horror uh effects artist is tom savini uh-huh. tom savini was a photographer in nam oh so he knew what all that shit uh, looked like that's not a busted yeah. in skull i'll yeah. show you a busted you in skull. See a lower intestine <laughs> i'll show you a lower intestine so i mean he, he so he makes these couple of uh of david has horror movies diodato House on the Edge of the Park, Cut and Run is another one. And then he kind of goes back to doing like TV movies and stuff. And uh, he's still alive today. Diodaro. Diodaro. And he's got, uh, he's supposedly got a companion movie planned. Called, For Cannibal Holocaust? Called Cannibals. But I mean, will we ever see it? Who knows? And Eli Roth's Green Inferno that just came out is named out. Uh, it's p- such a homage to Cannibal Holocaust. It's uh-huh. ridiculous. It's the Green Inferno is what they call the area they're going to in the movie uh-huh. Cannibal Holocaust. Uh-huh. So that's where that comes from. But I want to. So uh, he's alive, and we don't know his whereabouts. Well, of... he's—I mean, he's in Italy. Uh huh. He came up under the father of Isabella Rossellini, making movies and stuff. No shit. Yeah, like all of these guys in Italy that became successful or didn't are still very interwoven. Mm-hmm. You know, like Sergio Leone and mm-hmm. like would see all of these guys as contemporaries. Right. And the thing about Cannibal Holocaust is it, it does, it still has this sweeping, beautiful score underneath it by Riz Ortolani. So it, like the stylishness of even hardcore European gore. They still have a sweet, There's sweet still soundtrack. something about it where you're like, man, they're getting away with this somehow. Yeah. You know, like, and it's, it's, it's brutal and terrible, you know, but uh, <laughs> there's just something about it. So a lot of a lot of this stuff in the and the stuff that got swept up in the video nasties in the eighties in England, all of these very extreme exploitation horror movies, a lot of them were were called snuff on the covers of the papers. Now snuff has a very distinct definition. Snuff is murder on film 
for sale and real. It's real, but it's for public consumption. So the origins of snuff are from Manson. When Manson did all of his shit, some rumor came out in the middle of that saying that he had reels buried in Death Valley from when he was out there of movies of him killing people with the with the old clan. The family. The family. And it just was a rumor that took off. And then people were just like the public just accepted, oh yeah, this like but don't forget violence is going through the roof. Mm-hmm. Through all throughout the 70s. And yeah. believing in snuff was very easy. But The serial killer stuff, the... But there's yeah. never been a conclusively proven snuff film, which is murder for entertainment. But people would just believe that it was real. And a lot of these movies were labeled snuff. Like, oh yeah, real people die. And like the public would just take over. But they're not. None of them are. Because even if like a serial killer kills somebody on film, that's for their consumption. Right. So there's a, a great book called Killing for Culture that explores this. And they break it up into three different parts. They break it up into movies, theatrical films accused of being snuff. The second part is all the Mondo movies and Faces of Death. And then the third part is stuff like Bud Dwyer shooting himself. You know what I mean? So he breaks it into that whole thing. And part of their thesis in the book is that they're saying, we want to believe that we're so bad as people that snuff movies exist. Mm. But by believing this... Are we almost willing them to exist one day? Right. Which came first? Right. The ability to believe we're this bad. Yeah. Right. The snuff film or the the idea of the snuff film, which then brings about the snuff film. Right. Yeah. Are you asking for it? So, again, uh, pivoting on David Hess' last house on the left, I want to talk about a man named Roger Watkins, who was in the porno industry and he a lot of crossover, right? Yeah, um, this is very much the same time he's in New York that our guest Brian O'Hara from episode two. Go back and listen to the Prince of Porn episode. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, incredible. This guy is working on porn, and he he gets some money from his father, oh. uh, about three thousand uh, dollars. This is in the seventies, right? Like this 70- is uh, seventy three actually, okay. but the movie didn't really get traction till like seventy seven. Mm-hmm. And he writes this movie. He's fucking stoned on meth <laughs> at, like out of his mind on meth okay and he writes this movie that's very Manson-esque and he, he calls it the cuckoo clocks of hell which I think is a Vonnegut reference and uh, he's he makes this movie that is about a guy who gets out of prison talking he's talking to some other scumbags that he knows and he's a real piece of shit and this is played by Watkins himself oh, he's the main character and he's also director, directing star. he only spends $800 of the budget on the movie. And the rest on The meth. rest on meth. <laughs> like, <laughs> you could consider that production and cost. And the movie has this fury behind it that is like a guy on meth made this. Um, the audio is ter- terrible. He's always kind of like, he's always kind of laughing and talking like this and he's a real <laughs> piece of shit. You know, he's fucking... T- <laughs> and, 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 and he's talking about, yeah, I used to make stag movies, but I couldn't sell them. So like, eh, eh, you know, and people are like, oh, well, I know these guys that are like into making fucked up movies and shit and... So he he basically hooks him up with some people that are supposed to be like upper class hoity toity people that love shocking things mm-hmm. and they're like the upper classes that want to see the worst violence like, and they're at this party and the type of people that would commission a snuff film right and they're they're casually watching some 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 shitty bestiality porn and the guy who's like bankrolling the thing is like ah the dog's walking away she's not even fucking it you know like just dog's not play. dog's not into it how do you expect me to be into it yeah and there's this party going on and the guy the the bankroller's wife is meanwhile in the other room this fucking scene happens she comes out of the bathroom in blackface Oh. Yeah. And she's basically uh, nude, right? Following her are, like, the fucking the hunchback of Notre Dame. Like, seriously, like, a fucking, like, a guy who is doing the best job of looking like a fucked up hunchback. And he's huge. You know what I mean? He's like Hodor. <laughs> it's like Hodor's shoulder was connected to his chin. <laughs> and so he's, he's all... He's all fucked up. And behind him is a little boy in a fucking tuxedo. Oh, my God. With a pillow. Huh? He's holding a pillow in two hands. And on that pillow rests a whip. Oh. And he just, he's just holding. It, it's just a, where did this child is, come is this from? this fucking David Lynch's meth nightmare? This yeah. thing is just insane. And, it, and he holds out the pillow for this giant hunchback who then takes it and starts whipping this woman in blackface. <laughs> 
for the entertainment of these rich perverts. And they're all laughing. They love it. Because the bestiality movie just wasn't doing it. So this guy, T- Terry Hawkins' character, uh, who's Roger Watkins, the director and writer and lead, um, he's basically saying, okay, I know what these guys want. And he gets a shitty Super 8 movie, and he's now hooked up with a bunch of other low lives, another guy and two girls. And they have some warehouse space, and they fucking... Uh, they kidnap this blind guy and tie him up. Uh, and now, like, all of this music starts, which is, like, Gregorian chants uh, for the soundtrack. And you hear whispering. And suddenly this dude appears in a fucking, in, like, a, the mask of, like, a Greek god. <laughs> okay? Like, a white mask. Mm-hmm. And he's just got a fucking switchblade and starts carving up this blind guy. And then they give this movie back to the rich people, and they would love it. Right? So this is all a thing of, like, you know, the saying. Well, there's some political, yeah, okay, it's not totally without merit. So in this thing, basically, they now are like, well, we're total scumbags, and we hate everybody. Like, if we're willing to do this, you don't want to be in business with us. So, of course, they end up trapping all of the bankrollers, all of, like, the high-end people, and then making a movie of them disemboweling all of them. And they're wearing, like, those white translucent, ma- like, those translucent masks, you know what I mean? So you can just see, like, a, like a weird white face yeah. underneath, like, painted on eyebrows and stuff. Yeah, that's creepy. It's terrifying. And, again, this music is just continuing. And it's, the audio is terrible. You hear all this whispering and laughing. And it's just like a fucking, it's just like a methed out fever dream with some of the most horrifying gore. Okay, so where I mean, where were they get? If this guy spent eight hundred bucks on this movie, how are they making such like? Her- he just took. He, he was at the University of Oneonta in New York and just had a bunch of people willing to work for free and a bunch of free locations. And they knew how to make. And they knew how. And facts. They, yeah, he's he basically read read a book on how to make movies and then made this movie. And he, the original, he read, he read the book in thirty minutes. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, and the book is or uh, speed reading. The bu- the book like he was just like yeah it taught me everything I needed to know and I made this movie and it was the original cut is three hours long right so it's called the Cuckoo Clocks of Hell somehow this movie gets stolen from the guy okay like the print yeah and it get, it turns up in like 1977 uh, on the drive-in circuit you know this is like kind of one of the things you could do is you could just sell a movie to the drive-in circuit and then those guys could recut it re-edit it and now mm-hmm. they slimmed it down to like. 85 minutes. Mm-hmm. So the three-hour cut is gone forever. Nobody ever sees that again. Oh. It's it's renamed The Fun House, okay? Uh-huh. And he's back to working in porn, and he's like, one of my coworkers came in and was telling me about this fucked up movie he saw in the city, and I was like, holy shit, that's my movie. And then I bought a ticket to go see it. And uh, people were freaking out in the theater, right? Yeah. At the original... There was an original premiere of the movie when he still had it, and it was in New York and Chicago. Riots at both. And this is not bullshit marketing. No, 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 no. This is like in Chicago they set the seats on fire. Yes, I've heard about this. They were I did hear about this. furious yes. about this movie. And that was very much like this guy's kind of point of view was like very much trying to piss people off. Like they asked him about it's the very scene. punk rock. In, yeah, they asked him about the scene in blackface, and he's like, oh, yeah, just I'm trying to piss people off. Like not unlike our last uh, pri- pr- previous episode. Yes, very um, much. Dick so. Dart, Doc Dart, Doc Dart. I'm yeah, Dick Dart's <laughs> something else. So yeah, so the Funhouse comes out. It's in the drive-ins, and then later on, somebody else makes another cut of it, and they're trying to cash in on Last House on the Left, and they rename it Last House on Dead End Street. Then the movie disappears because everybody who had this thing knows that they ripped this guy off. So you kind of got to make a quick buck and then get the fuck out of there. So this is all pre-internet. So for all of the 80s, all of the 90s, this movie is just a story. Mm -hmm. And it's passed down to the point that people think it's not even real. And then a lot of people think it's real snuff because nobody ever... And it's so low rent, low budget, so so shitty. shitty. And, and, And How could it not be? And it's also clearly made by a guy drugged out of his mind. And then, so then there was like just a theory, like, oh, this 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 movie is just an urban legend. So it's not till two thousand that Roger Watkins signs onto some message board and like gives like the history and all that stuff. And then they eventually have a DVD re-release, but the original cut of the movie is just it's gone, still gone, it's just long, long gone. And Watkins was baffled that people were so into it. But again, it's another movie where 
it's asking the audience, like, do you want all this blood and guts? Right. It's a mo- and it's also another movie within a movie. Yes. Which seems to be a theme in 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 exploitation a little bit. So it, can, it gives you this, like, lens. Well, it seems like it's through this prism of people that are, like, I have to do porn and I have to do shitty horror movies because that's where I'm getting work. But I actually have more to say. So now I've turned on the genre and using and use the genre, use the genre to genre. critique itself. But also while being the height of the genre. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah. like, and, and that happens often t- in other movies, too. I mean, like even mainstream stuff like 21 Jump Street is that it's a parody of the buddy cop high schooler genre. But it's also peak of the genre. Yeah. They do that a lot. And I think that's a sign of true genius. Yeah. I mean, uh, they say- Or so, meth. They, right. Well, they say Roger Watkins just after this, uh, I mean, he basically dealt with a lot of mental illness and a lot of drug addiction. Um, supposedly, some of the the budget was also spent on heroin, not just meth. Well, you got to sleep. Right. So I cannot find- enough about how he died. He did die in 2007. Uh-huh, and you don't know. In upstate New York, I have no idea the circumstances. Scouring around, haven't been able to find anything. Um, upstate New York, also where, where Phil Prince where Phil robbed Prince. the haagen Well, and supposedly died. lives. Uh, right. Oh, that's right. We gotta, yeah. we gotta find that guy, too. Yeah. So we gotta find uh, Watkins. Right. Well, Prince, no, well, Watkins died. Uh, oh, Diodato. Mm-hmm. We gotta, find, we gotta find Diodato. Right. Prince. Yeah, yeah. And Phil Prince, not Prince. No, Prince also dead. He is RIP. dead. Uh and um and Dart, Doc Dart. This uh th- this movie is I mean, like the the Last House on Dead End Street is probably the most true to the Manson esque aspect of like what if um so because well, and because they go after the bourgeois, they go after those rich yeah, bankrolling right. elites. Yeah, and I mean that he's named Terry Hawkins and w- works in porn. It's very much like a self-loathing reflection of himself. Mm-hmm. And the the family aspect is taken on by these girls and guys who just go along with it because they're all fucking scummy people. Mm-hmm. One of the girls wearing this translucent mask appears to one of the people they're going to murder and has a dismembered goat hoof between her legs huh? like a penis and makes this guy Suck fillet it. it. Yes. Uh, I cannot wait to see this movie. <laughs> it, is, it is so out of hand. It's I, a nightmare. Um, it's it's a really true nightmare. Right? They, they say movies are, are you know, they're, they're dreams, right? They're col- uh, and, and exploitation is, it's got to be the nightmares. Yeah. Even I'm, more than horror because horror is not really scary. These fucked up exploitation snuff esque movies are really they're just so bizarre and so mm-hmm. taboo and they don't have to make sense. Right. That they are way more like nightmares because they, they tap in they're all about those collective like fear archetypes of mm-hmm. like getting eaten or eating something you shouldn't eat. Yeah. Being raped, cults, uh, right. all that it, it seems like there's this 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 kind of vibe like woven through the most extreme movies that like real gore and horror fans love there's always like a common theme of anger from the director like Wes Craven was like I was I didn't see a movie till I was 18 his parents never let him and I was I was angry at the world and feeling lied to and I made a very angry movie you know and it seems like Watkins is angry at the entire exploitation thing. Mm. His life. Diodato is angry at the media and the Mondo producers. Like they're like in the most extreme horror movies that really wet the appetite of like the bloodthirsty cinephile. There's always an angry, angry director. It, it's it's almost like that. Um, gosh, I don't think we've talked about it on this show before. Maybe some other show, but you know that old um, that Daffy Duck cartoon where you know no, no act was ever good enough well you want an act you want to see my act you want to see something you really want to see it right. okay well you take the nitroglycerin and you take the gunpowder and you take the tnt and then you take the match and then you swallow it and you light and then he explodes and he dies and they're like yeah fuck yeah. yeah 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 they're like daddy do it again he's like i can only do it once right but it's like there's that anger of you okay you want to see something fucked up I'll give it to you. And just it, out of spite, they make exactly yeah. what they end up wanting. And yeah. There's really no limit to our appetite. Yeah. For... And, but I think I think the one thing about this is that 
these guys were at least taking a lot of the violence of the world into like a play area in cinema, but they really were angry about the betrayal of media disti- like taking on these lessons from Mondo of like skewing the news to make people seem more fucked up like as crime rates plummeted in the 90s crime reporting flew up and it's the same it's because it's they were like now. yeah they were like we have to sell it sells it always works and i just can't even imagine the real violence that was going on in the 80s and 70s the real life violence oh, it was, was astonishing yes it just kept going up and up and people were like in the like in the seventies, they were like, "Get ready for the eighties, because last year was worse than." The and now year we got before. crack. And yeah, and then when the nineties were coming, eighty nine, shit, it was fucking through the roof. And they were like, "Get ready for the nineties," and then it fucking finally dropped. Right. You know. You can attribute that to a bunch of different things. There's controversial, of course. Very but, controversial, but, but it was a market drop in crime, and uh, but, at the but, exact age uh, that people would have been coming of age post post uh, Roe v. Wade. Right. And and. And you, there's a few other theories as well, but that's the fun one to think about. It's also the best theory. <laughs> it's pretty great, and economic, and 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 uh, well, money. That's about it. But right, we all would like to think about the Freakonomics part mm-hmm. of the Freakonomics book that talks about that. But a really great movie that that deals with this is uh, is Nightcrawler. Yeah, Nightcrawler. Even it's it's toward the I think it's toward the end of the movie where. They discover that this murder that happened in the suburbs, the really nice suburbs, was really a drug motivated robbery kind of organized crime thing. Yeah. And they're like, no, 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 no. This is random breaking and entering. Yeah. Because that's what you got to keep people on their toes, man. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and that's that's never changed. Right. Yeah. And, but I feel like the you know like back when like the Night Stalker. Not the Nightcrawler. When no. the Night Stalker was around, like they, there was actually a murderer coming in through your window. Oh yeah, close your window. I mean, that was happening here, and I mean, but people still seemed less afraid than than they do now. People seem more afraid now than yeah. ever. Do you think it's because they lived through that, and it was so it was novel then, and almost like unbelievable at the time, and that now we're, this generation, that's kind of you know this baby boom generation that is in their fifties, sixties. They were young during those years, and so it's formative for them. Right, right. It it scarred them, and so now they're all just like you know the people who grew up during World War II have been scarred by the idea of fascism, communism, and Nazism. Yeah, and so now they're hypersensitive. Not that it's any of it's a good thing, but they are more sensitive to those ideas. Well, because... also, I mean, word is traveling slower back then. Yeah, right. There's yeah. the it's not the fucking and there was no there information were, age, and there was you know four news sources. Yeah, and so it was that was it. Yes. Um, no alternative news, no alternative facts. Still some fake news, but right. Uh, yeah, I mean, there was, there really was that crime wave of the '70s where it was unprecedented. I mean, serial killers, BTK killer. Yeah. Though that was the hot thing, and it wasn't. I don't. I don't think sensationalist any more than it was factual. That was the type of crime that was being committed. Yeah. It's so weird. Where did, where did it go? I mean, <laughs> my theory of where serial killers went? Yeah. Two things. People started realizing like it was really easy to get caught. Also, the whole trend of not killing people but just keeping them in your house forever started. Oh, yeah. Why get oh, guy, why ruin a good thing? I mean, like that was like there was like 10 different stories that broke around the same time where it's like another guy with a woman in his house for 20 years? Oh, yeah, that happened. That was a big thing. The the Austrian guy, the, Austrian the guy, guy Cleveland. Cleveland, the guy out here that Me? had a <laughs> Oh, yeah, the guy in, like, Fontana or something like that? Or yeah, where? there was, like, a lady in his backyard. Yeah. And, P- and the neighbor's like, oh, would you would see her every once in a while? Yeah, I mean, fucking ridiculous. Yeah, that that was the big thing. You know, right. I mean, if you go through the trouble of abducting somebody, why are you going to kill him right away? you got to milk it for all it's worth, in my opinion. <laughs> that was, that was their... It doesn't happen every day. <laughs> you stumble across one of these losers. Right, well, you're like, I'm not, I'm not going to leave some trail of blood. <laughs> you're like, yeah, she's out back. What do you want? <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, another one of these fucked up guys, and this is probably just going to be another episode, is the, the Toy Box Killer. Do you ever hear about him? The Toy Box Killer is a story for another day that we will talk about here. I'm going to uh, tease that one. Maybe that one, I'll, I'll do that one. Can you I should do that one. I'm going to do that one. That. Well, it's been bedtime stories for Aaron since we started, so I'd like you to tell well, me a story. you know how hard it is for me to go to sleep at <laughs> night? I can't just <laughs> close my eyes and just fall asleep in the dream. I've I know, got demons. I know. i got to tell you about some woman with a dismembered deer hoof getting uh, sucked off so you can mm. go to sleep. 
Well, that was such. Those were two very, very fun stories, and I'm gonna go watch those movies tonight. I think. I just think that they're. I mean, first of all, they're the biggest movies of either of their careers, and they are just astonishingly fucked up, fascinating movies. Um, not an easy watch by any stretch of the imagination. Maybe you, bro. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, I want to say a couple of things here. Um, we are uh, now officially on the Unpopular Opinion Network. Which is very, very nice for us and for you, the listener. Yeah, and we will be on uh, the uh, iTunes as well as the Patreon. Patreon. I want to thank Matt Brousseau for doing a killer job with the audio. My friend Joe Latchett, who was uh, kind of a lot of the inspiration for this being a podcast mm-hmm. instead of a writing project, mm-hmm. he was saying that he thought uh, the audio was handled extremely well, especially during like uh, the interview with Brian. And like when we're shouting a lot, he makes it sound very yes. crisp. Uh, very... It's very hard. It's very hard to to have laughter not be annoying in a podcast, and uh, that especially sounds yours. great. Yes, mine is particularly Ugh. grating. Um, I want to thank Rick Wood for, for helping me compose this uh, fantastic. Intro music, and uh, I want to... And the outro. Wait for the outro, too, because it's worth a listen. It is. Um, So thanks, everybody. Uh, Artwork. Very, very excited. Artwork by Joe Latchett again, who was uh, the... um, The inspiration. The inspiration for this being a podcast. Uh, Today is the day Dick Gregory passed away. Rest in peace. Rest in peace. Uh, I want to thank my co-host Aaron Pita. Congratulations on his roast battle win against me. Oh, well, you know, it's... It wasn't that big of a deal. I know you love it, you f- well, fucking yeah, maniac. Did they feed? They give you the easy ones first. <laughs> um, thank I you guys. Think, and thank you, thank you for battling me. I had a great time. There's nobody else I prefer being shitty to thank and you. with. Um, please keep an eye out for uh, the Heath Barcelona sketch coming out. Uh, Heath Barcelona Vegas, which is being edited by our friend and. Former guest on the program, Mr. Brian, Brian O'Hara. Mm. Thanks be to him. Mm-hmm. And thank you guys for listening. We're going to bring you a lot more weirdos in the future. I am John Fahey. Good night. I'm Aaron Pita. Sweet dreams.